David, it's still time for you to preach also if you want. <laughs> Our scripture reading this morning comes from Paul's letter to Philemon, chapter 1, verses 8 through 16. It can be found on page 216 in your Red Pew Bibles. Otherwise, it's kind of hard to find back there, huh? Let us listen for God's holy word. For this reason, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty, yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. And I, Paul, do this as an old man and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I'm appealing to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, that is, my own heart back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while, so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you in both in the flesh and in the Lord. Sisters and brothers, this is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, this month, I would like for us to have a little fun with scripture study. And so what we'll be doing in the next couple weeks is actually looking at some scripture texts or stories that are a little bit less popular than others. And so this morning, we are looking at the letter of, to, uh, to Philemon, and it's talking about the subject, the individual name Onesimus. And so we're going to read through a little bit of it this morning. And I hope if you haven't read this letter yet before you do so, you can go back and maybe read the other couple verses if you like. But if you have, perhaps this is a way for us to learn a little bit more about these characters here. So here's a confession. I can be judgmental at times. Maybe you are too, maybe you're not. You're not. I'm not saying you're judgmental. I'm not saying you're judgmental. But I can be judgmental at times. It's part of my personality that can be a bit of a double-edged sword. You see, the positive side means that I can generally make pretty clear decisions after gathering the needed information. The negative side, though, means that it shows up when I sometimes quickly jump to conclusions about ideas, or worse, about people. It's easy to decide and to do this when it comes to judging other people, usually based on looks and appearance and often without knowing anything else about that person. So we'll take a little bit of an experiment here for you all to to think about this, all right? This imagination of the mind here. When I mention people from the east side of Portland, what do you think? I know, I know some of us are actually from the east side. I'm just playing with (laughs) y'all. But a stereotype still popped up for you, right? When I mention people that can be found in Walmart, what do you think? And if you're not familiar with this idea, maybe you can Google search this later on when you get home. Who comes to mind? When I mention the homeless, what thoughts come across? When I mention Jews, when I mention Muslims, When I mention Mexicans, what judgments do we live with about people? Moving to the Bible Belt of Central Virginia, 
back in 2012 was a cultural transformation for me. I remember turning on the radio to my favorite sports talk station one Sunday morning, only to realize that it was not sports talk that particular morning, but rather a radio preacher speaking with an odd southern drawl, proclaiming salvation in Jesus Christ. Who is this fool? I demanded as I quickly turned that station to my progressive public radio station. Months later, I met that fool. He was a preacher of a small church built way up on a mountain where there was no running water, but plenty of rural poverty surrounding the area. As you can imagine, I quickly came to my conclusions about this preacher. And then I learned more. I learned that he drove a Toyota Prius. <laughs> and my world was turned upside down. Wait a minute. Was I wrong about this guy? I thought to myself. I learned about his radio program and how he continued it on a shoestring budget because of the calls and letters he got from other mountain locals who told him how they didn't quite feel worthy enough to go to church, but they felt loved every time they heard his program just before Sports Center. I learned about how this self described redneck from the mountains was actually a retired educator who spent most of his career teaching in the Harlem neighborhood of New York City before moving with his family to rural Virginia. This fool gathered other churches and preachers together from all different backgrounds, races, and ethnicities who had never previously interacted for shared ministry, going door to door, up and down that mountain holler, getting children to summer camp for free so that those kids could spend one week of their summer in a place where they didn't have to worry about where they would eat or think about their parents in jail or wonder about the drugs that controlled their small mountain neighborhoods. He helped his small mountain church that that church that didn't have running water of their own, meet other Christians from all walks of life around the country and the world to raise thousands of dollars to build wells in Africa. He even arranged for Miss Virginia to make a visit to that small church and make it a regular stop on her schedule each and every year so that the local kids could meet her and possibly get a glimpse of how they could live one day. I learned about how he took care of his grandchildren almost every day, about his wife living with cancer. And he asked me to pray for him. Needless to say, I was the fool when it came to understanding who exactly was called to share the love of Christ with the world. And I asked him to pray for me as well. Just not on the radio. We are not immune to judgments about others of falling into these inhumane practices in the name of societal order simply because we call ourselves Christians. We all have prejudices and biases. And for some reason in our society today, we have created a series of conscious and subconscious classes and judgments about individuals and communities that we share the world with every single day. Is that person educated enough? Are they the right political affiliation? 
Are they a citizen? Are they the right sexual orientation? Do they believe the same thing about the Bible that I do? We all live with judgments about every other person each and every day of our lives. So what does following Jesus have to say about how we understand ourselves and our relationship with others in this world filled with divisions within humanity? That is our challenge this morning. So we're reading from Paul's letter to Philemon today. You can pronounce it any way you like. Some people say Philemon. Some people say Philemon. Uh, There's no particular way. Um, I'll just go with the way that I, I have come to know it. Now, not many of us have perhaps read this letter before. It's only a few verses. It doesn't have any memorable quotes per se, and there are no miracles or amazing stories to act out in Sunday school or VBS. Rather, this letter, it seems to be rather short and normal for its time, but when we dwell and we delve into the words of it a little further, what we discover is a message that is quite deep theologically impactful, and by all accounts for the time, rather revolutionary. Again, Philemon is short letter. It's only 25 verses. And the opening verses are a greeting from Paul, the Apostle Paul, similar to many of his other letters. And who is Philemon? He writes, he is a dear friend and a co-worker according to the opening words. And we can gather that Philemon may be a Christian of some notoriety or public status based on what we read. We read that the Christian community of this region gathered in his home. And it seems that Paul is addressing this letter to Philemon. And it's also important to note that he is addressing this letter to other individuals by name and, quote, to the church in your house. Paul means for Philemon to read this in front of the entire Christian community. This is a public address written as an individual request. And Paul continues the letter by praising Philemon for all of his past faithfulness and love over the years. It seems that the two men have a long, trusting history and relationship together. And then things take a bit of a turn for Philemon. As he reads this letter aloud in front of the Christian community in his house, Paul is asking a favor of sorts. And it seems to be a bit of a big ask by the way that Paul is even introducing this idea. Paul is obviously an authoritative role between the two men. And he writes in verse 8, For this reason, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty. See, we are not too familiar with the language these days unless we were perhaps in the military. Duty? Is Philemon Paul's soldier? And just then, Paul also quickly walks back the language a little bit in verse 9. Yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. It seems that Paul wants to be sure that Philemon understands the implication for the coming request as he reads this letter aloud with all of his Christian community listening. And Paul adds a few more lines just to make sure that Philemon is perhaps humbled enough by this request from Paul, an old man, as it says, in jail for leading the very Christian movement that Philemon is now part of. And I, Paul, do this as an old man, now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. So what is Paul's request? Well, we read it here in the following verses. In verse 10, I'm appealing to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. It seems that Paul is writing about a younger man named Onesimus whose Paul has become close with to the point of calling him his own child during this imprisonment. Verse 11, formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, that is, I'm sending my own heart back to you. 
man, Paul is laying it on thick here, right? So who the heck is Onesimus? It seems that Onesimus used to be in relationship with Philemon, but somehow got separated, and it seems that perhaps Philemon, Philemon still has some influence over Onesimus' actions. Verse 13, I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. And then we get the whole story of Onesimus' relationship with Philemon. Onesimus is Philemon's slave. Hmm. Well, this just got a little bit more complicated, right? And now we learn of Paul's big ask of Philemon and found in verse 15. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. You see, Paul, who was in prison as an aging old man, sent a letter back to Philemon, who is Paul's loyal follower. And who brings this letter to Philemon? None other than Onesimus. Philemon's slave, who somehow left Philemon's presence, well, he ran off, as we might expect. And now Paul asks Philemon in front of the entire Christian community as he's reading this aloud to receive an isthmus back without punishment. And not only that, but he is to receive an isthmus back into the community not as a slave, but as a beloved brother, a free man. When we think about this letter a little bit further, we can then understand that the implications for such a message are quite revolutionary. How would such a letter be understood among other Christians gathered in that place? Were there other slaves of Philemon that were hearing such a message as he was reading it to the Christian community? Were there others in the audience that also owned slaves? And what does this say about such relationships within this Christian community moving forward? Paul continues in verse 17. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing about your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, let me have this benef benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ, confident of your obedience. I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. And just in case Philemon is thinking that Paul is maybe bluffing, he continues on in verse 22. One more thing. Prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping through your prayers to be restored to you. Friends, the good news this morning, God calls us all into radical Christian community. The boundaries and classes that we have created, either intentionally or unintentionally, consciously or unconsciously, legally, or illegally no longer exist when it comes to kingdom living. When it comes to following the way of Christ, we are to live as sisters and brothers in Christ Jesus. It's as simple as that. And so what does this mean for Valley Community in the days and years ahead? Who are we being called to love as brothers and sisters? What does this mean in your life? What relationships need to be reminded of their holy implications? Thank you, God, for the opportunity to follow you more closely each and every day of our lives.
no matter how uncomfortable it may be and no matter where it may lead. May all of God's children say, Amen.